We are in the midst of the month of Elul, the final month in the Jewish calendar year, and the month that precedes Rosh Hashanah. And this month, these days are the most powerful days of the Jewish calendar. And there are many practices and customs that are already underway. So after the morning services after Shachris, we blow the shofar. We say a special chapter in Psalms, Psalms 27, twice a day at the conclusion of the prayers. In Sephardic communities, they have already begun saying the selichot, the prayers of repentance and atonement, since the beginning of the month. And Ashkenazi communities, we begin saying selichot the week before Rosh Hashanah. And what I wanted to investigate in this podcast is what is the essence of these days and what's the opportunity of these days. Now, whenever we talk about festivals, it's important to give the following introduction. Our sages tell us that from a spiritual perspective, time is not linear. We're told that the Almighty created time in a year-long cycle And each day is a station of time that we revisit each year. And on a deeper level, when the Almighty created time, every day of the calendar year was endowed with certain inherent spiritual powers. So every day is this station of time that we revisit in the yearly cycle and every day we are capable of absorbing certain spiritual energies that exist in that particular station of time in the year. Now this reveals to us an incredible insight. When something really big, when something transformative happens in a day, if there's a festival, for example, that we're celebrating on a specific day to mark an event that happened back in history, what in effect we're doing is that we're not just celebrating the past, we're not just commemorating, reminiscing about events of yesteryear. What we are saying is that when something important happens on a given day, that reveals that the underlying spiritual power of that day that spiritual station in the calendar had certain powers that were manifested in a given festival. In the words of Ramchal, there are spiritual lights and power in each day. And when something transformative happens, the Jewish people leave Egypt on Pesach and Passover. And we, of course, every Pesach, every Passover, we try to reenact it, to try to live it. We have, of course, the mitzvahs that we do on Pesach, and we have, of course, the Seder that we celebrate. It's important to understand, we are not just commemorating the past. We're not memorializing an event of the past, but we are attempting to relive the spiritual power and energy that was always inherent in that day and was manifested by the Exodus. So, for example, this is the best example to portray this concept. In Genesis chapter 18, verse 3, this is during the episode where the angels came to Sodom and Gomorrah and they overturned the city, but they saved Lot, the relative of Abraham. So the verse tells us that Lot was inviting them into his house, these angels. He thought they were people and they didn't want initially to go to his house, but he insisted and eventually they yielded, and they went to his house. And the verse tells us that he prepared a feast for them and baked matzah, the unleavened bread that, of course, we eat on Pesach. So Rashi, in his comment to Genesis 18.3, tells us, based upon a midrash, the reason why Lot baked matzah for the angels, that he thought were people that were masquerading as people, The reason for that is because it was Pesach. Now, if you read this, it sounds incredibly odd. This story is happening in the time of Abraham. We have Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. Until the Jewish people go to Egypt, they spend hundreds of years in Egypt. 
So at this point in history, when Lot is feeding the angels masquerading as men, there is no Jewish people yet. They certainly haven't descended to Egypt, and they certainly haven't had the Exodus yet. Yet that day in the calendar was going to be Pesach, and Lot was celebrating it by eating matzah. What this reveals to us is that those days were always, since creation, since the Almighty created this cycle of time, these stations of time throughout the calendar year, these were days that were always designated for redemption and days when the lessons of matzah are germane, are topical, are suitable. And of course, when the time for the Exodus arrived, the correct time for redemption is the day of redemption, the Jewish calendar year, and that's the day of Pesach, and that's why redemption happened. So, in effect, what we're told here is that it's not that we're celebrating the festivals because of the events that happened, rather it's the opposite. The events of those days happened because the festival itself, the day itself, the station and time in the year itself was already bursting with the energy that was manifested in those days. So whenever we try to understand a holiday or a station in time or a time period like a month in the year, we have to always ask the question, okay, what do we know about this particular day or time and how can we try to investigate and discover what the specific energy of that day is? So we have the month of Elul. There's all kinds of laws and practices and customs that we do on Elul. And we ask the question, what is Elul? What event happened in Elul that could help us discover and reveal what the underlying spiritual energy of these days is? And I think that there's probably two interrelated answers, and this is going to pull away the curtain and let us discover what the energy of these days is, and to be able to set our spiritual compass to be aligned with these days. So the first thing we're told is that Moshe goes up to Mount Sinai to transcend to heaven for the third time to get the second set of tablets, and he ascended for 40 days. The first day is the first day of El. And the last day, the day that he came down with the second set of tablets, that was Yom Kippur. And we know the chronology. Moshe goes up at the revelation at Sinai when the Jewish people hear the Ten Commandments. He comes back down 40 days later, and sadly the nation is doing the same with the golden calf. He takes the golden calf, he grinds it up into dust, he puts it in the water, makes everyone drink it. The people that participated in that sin, they died. Moshe goes up a second time, this time not to get the tablets, to get the Torah, this time to stave off, so to speak, the Almighty's wrath. And then Moshe goes up a third time. The third time, Moshe goes up armed with a blank set of tablets. And over the course of the 40 days of Elul through Yom Kippur, the Almighty teaches him Torah a second time, and he gets the second set of tablets inscribed with the finger of God. Okay, so what does this have to do with us today? What is the spiritual energy that we can deduce from this story? So we find a little bit of a clue. Our sages tell us that these days were days of ratzon. The word ratzon is a little bit hard to define. We could translate it as days of will, maybe days of goodwill, or days of desire. Now, this idea or this definition of the month of El as days of Ratzon is found everywhere in Jewish literature, both in the hidden literature, the Kabbalistic literature, and in the revealed literature. But even Rashi, Rashi tells us in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11, when it goes through the chronology of the three 40-day periods of Moshe's ascensions to heaven, he tells us plainly, that just as the first set of 40 days were with ratzon, with goodwill, with desire, so too the last set of 40 days, i.e. the month of El, was also done 
with ratzon, with goodwill, with will, with desire. And in Jewish literature, these days are called yemei haratzon, the days of ratzon, the days of desire. Now, what exactly this means is not immediately clear. And I think that we could discover the answer by looking at the second notable thing that happened during Elul. Of course, after Elul is over, we have Rosh Hashanah. And Rosh Hashanah, that was the day of creation of man. According to the Talmud, that is the sixth day of creation. The world was created the 25th day of Elul. And then, of course, we have the whole description of Genesis. And day six, that's Rosh Hashanah. And that is the day that man was created. Now, the 25th day of Elul, the day that the world was created, according to the Talmud, that's not something we celebrate at all. It seems like creation was all about man, and that was actualized on day six, and that becomes Rosh Hashanah. So what was Elul? If Elul is the month before creation, before mankind, what do we know about what happened before creation. This is a very deep and I think fascinating insight over here. Our sages describe the month of El as the time of Ratzon, desire. On Rosh Hashanah, God created. He created man, and that's when the world and the world's purpose takes shape. On El, the month before Rosh Hashanah, God desired to create man. These are the days of will, because this is the time where God had the will to create. Now, I want to be very careful here. We're edging a little bit towards Kabbalistic territories. I want to be very gentle and careful with what we say. But our sages tell us, of course, an intelligent being only does intelligent things. We believe in higher intelligence. We believe that God created the world. And thus, if he created the world, he must have had a desire, a will to create that preceded creation. So why did God create the world? It's a very advanced question. Assuming, like we do, that the Almighty did create the world, we have to explore the question, okay, so why did he do it? He wouldn't do it for no reason. So our sages tell us, that the reason why God created the world is because he wanted to do good. He wanted to give. He wanted to be benevolent. But he could only be benevolent towards something else if there is something else that can be a receptacle of that divine goodness. So God created man, that man could be the perfect receptacle of God's goodness. So what do we have over here? We have creation. God creates man, and that is the fulfillment of creation. And before creation, there was a will, there was desire, there was ratzon to do good. Elul is the month preceding creation. The power of Elul is the power of desire to create. That divine will, that ratzon, that good will of Elul, the days of ratzon, is manifested by the Almighty being desirous to do good to us. And Rosh Hashanah, that's the day when the Almighty creates. That's the day when the Almighty gives life, apportions life and goodness and vitality to humanity. Elul, the month that precedes it, that's the month of Ratzon. That's the month of goodwill where he desires to give us good things on Rosh Hashanah. There's another very important point here. This is maybe the critical point of the idea. Elul and Rosh Hashanah are intimately connected. What does the Almighty create on Rosh Hashanah? He creates on Rosh Hashanah that that he desires to create during Elul. And who determines what's desired in Elul? So here's another critical point. The Almighty outsources that to us. 
He says, okay, you tell me what you want. And I will make what you want, what I want. And that's what El is about. And then I will actualize that desire, that Ratzon, on Rosh Hashanah. This is very deep stuff here. What's El all about? How do we maximize this month? This month is about deciding what we want when we arrive, so to speak, at the station of creation. On Rosh Hashanah, what do we want to be created with anew this year? That that we desire and that we strive for during Elul. This is the month to make a wish list of what we want in Rosh Hashanah. This is the month that the Almighty wants to help us get whatever we want in life. Anything that we want on Rosh Hashanah, we could get, provided that we prepare to receive it on this month. If we show that we want it during the month of Elo, during the month of goodwill, during the month of desire, if we put in the effort, if we take the first step, if we dedicate our prayers to it, if we develop the will to receive it, then... When the Almighty designates the bounty of goodness for us on Rosh Hashanah, the life, the vitality, the goodness, included in that package is everything that we strived for during the month of goodwill. Our sages have told us that the word Elul is hinted in the verse in Scripture, Ani lidodi vidodi li. I am to my beloved, I am to God, and God is to me. This is the month of closeness. This is the month where God is in our proximity. I am to him, he is to me. What we're told here is that we have to initiate. What we initiate in Elul, that's what the Almighty will reciprocate to us. He will have that will in Elul, and that will be reflected in what we get on Rosh Hashanah. Ani Dodi, I am to my beloved. I have to start... I have to trigger this process of goodwill. And then the Almighty says, He will have that same goodwill, that same desire. And then when it comes to actualization of that desire, Rosh Hashanah, that is the bounty that we will receive. The Almighty has endless blessings for us. He wants to give it all to us. If only... We want to receive it from him. Let's go back to the original Elul. Again, we're told, Moshe goes up the first time. He goes up with nothing, comes back down with tablets that are inscribed by God. And that does not have a very long shelf life because he gets down the bottom of the mountain. He's carried the tablets for maybe a few minutes He sees the revelry of the golden calf and he shatters those stones. The first of the tablets, the tablets that God created and inscribed, they really did not last very long. What happens on the first day of Elul? It's been about 80 days since the Sinai experience. The first set of tablets are still shattered all over the floor. And God says to Moses, okay, let's try this again. Exodus 34.1, God said to Moses, carve for yourself two stone tablets like the first set of tablets, and I will inscribe upon the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you shattered. There's a very critical difference between the first set of tablets and the second set of tablets. Both of them are inscribed by God. The difference is that the first set of tablets, God created the stones and inscribed them. The second set of tablets, God says to Moses, okay, you prepare the stones and I'll inscribe them with the same words, but it's going to be a team effort. And indeed, that's what happened. Moshe prepares the stone tablets and God indeed inscribed on them what was written on the first set of tablets, the Ten Commandments. And that happened, of course, in the month of Elul. That is the power of this month. We 
must carve the stones. We must prepare the canvas. We must develop the will and the desire. And the Almighty says, okay, if you will it, I will actualize that desire and I'm going to inscribe on those stones. I'm going to paint on that canvas whatever it is that you want. This is the month of developing, working up an appetite for the blessings and the goodness of Rosh Hashanah. And it's terrifying. We blow the shofar. Shofar is there to evoke fear. But our sages tell us that this fear is not just the fear of judgment. It's the fear of wasting the opportunity. Every day, Shacharis is over. You hear the shofar. What's it supposed to remind you? It's supposed to remind you this is the time where God says, okay, what do you want? Open up your mouth and I'll fill it. Whatever you want, you get. And the shofar is there to make us remember the power of this day not to lose it. I heard a parable from one of my rabbis. Someone wins a prize. What do you have? What's the prize? You have 60 seconds in the department store. You could grab whatever you want. Whatever you grab, you keep. Of course, that's exhilarating. It's exciting. But you're nervous. You're anxious. You have fear because this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. And you don't want to miss it. You don't want to fall short. You don't want to lose this opportunity. El was like that. The Almighty is here amongst us. And he says, okay, carve the stone. What do you want? Whatever you desire us of, I'm going to be desirous of as well. And I'm going to fulfill that come Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. We have 60 seconds in the department store. We have maybe 30 or 40 days in the department store. And we don't want to miss that. And we blow the shofar to remember what these days are all about. And maybe we could extend this parable a little bit. The Yetzahara, evil inclination, our old nemesis, he likes to dangle the cheap thrills in front of us. You're in the department store. What do you, what should you do? Grab the things that really matter. Grab the things that could be life changing. But what does he try to encourage us to do? Here's some candy. Here's some chocolate. Grab some treats. Focus on the empty calories. Take some instant gratification. But if you wise up, you focus on what can be life-changing. What do we ask for in Rosh Hashanah? The main thing we ask for is life. And we specify. Zachreinu l'chaim. Remember us for life. A king who is desirous of life. And inscribe us in the book of life. And then we define what we mean. Leman chaolakim chaim. We want a life that is for you. We want a life that really matters. We don't want to just be alive like a programmed android that has tissue. Our saints tell us that the wicked are dead even when they're alive. And the righteous are alive even when dead. The Torah's definition of life is very different than what you would find in an ICU, God forbid. In our view, what really matters is the eternal life, the life of our soul. And God forbid someone's wicked. They may be alive. Their body might be alive, but it's a shell. And the soul is dead within them. The righteous, even when they're dead, when their body is dead, their soul is still alive. We have everything on the table for us. Everything's available for us. God says, what do you want? And here, we have these 30 days, these 40 days in the department store. And we are reminded to ask for a life that matters, to ask for a life of eternity, to ask for a life for God, that we're connected to the source of all goodness and all life. As I mentioned earlier, one of the things that we do on Elul is we read Psalms 27. I think there's a verse in Psalms 27 that really encapsulates what we ought to strive for during this month that we could ask for anything. King David says, I have but one request from you. That's the only thing that I want. I want to sit in the house of God all the days of my life. I want to have a connection with you. 
We have everything on the table for us. Everything's available. We create our wish list. And our wish list can include anything. And the Almighty is benevolent. The Almighty says, okay, you decide what you want. And of course, the Yetzirah says to us, let's focus on all the little things, all the tangential, ancillary things, because that is what is appealing to us. That's what gives us gratification. That is what spikes our endorphins. But David is reminding us that all is a sideshow. Smoke and mirrors, distractions. You focus on a life that's connected to God, and you have that anyhow. All the other things come along with that. It's a total package. If you have God on your side, not only will you have the eternal spiritual life, but everything else, all the blessing in this world, comes along with a package. Don't focus, don't fret the little things, don't sweat the little things, because those things all come once you ask for the big thing. We ask for eternal life, if we have eternal life, if we have a life that God is close to us, that God is connected to us, that we are connected, we are plugged into God, of course, we'll have everything we need. Of course. The money says, okay, you're one of my, you're on my team. I got you covered. I got you back. Don't worry about it. We're good. And that's why it's important for us to A, recognize what El is all about, but also to try to organize our plan, our wish list for this year, and to ask for what really matters. I think the best way to approach this is to make a clear list of what you need to become big. Figure out what stands between who you are today and what you want to be, what you envision for yourself in your most idealized version of yourself. All of us were created with latent greatness. To fulfill our potential, we need to identify what that greatness is. We have to unlock it, we have to nurture it, and we have to actualize it. We're not complete. L is the time for us to figure out, what does my greatness look like? What are all the things that need to happen for me to get there? And now is the time to develop a will, to develop a desire, to develop a ratzon for that greatness. And take the first step. Initiate. Ani dodi. I am for my beloved. I'm going to try to become my best self in Elul. I'm going to develop a will for it. And that blessing, those bounties are going to be piled up on top of us come Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. This is the month where God didn't create yet, but developed, so to speak, the desire, the will, the Ratzon to create. But what does that look like? When we arrive at that station in time, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and we are created, we're created in the model, in the blueprint of what was desired to be created. Now is the time for us to figure out what do we want to be created in this upcoming cycle throughout the station of the year. May we all be so fortunate to hear the shrilling sound, the hallowed sound of the shofar and recognize this is opportunity. This is a golden opportunity. This is an opportunity that we best not squander. And may we indeed prepare for Rosh Hashanah, prepare for the day of creation, prepare for the day where we become receptacles of a deluge of divine goodness. That's what the Almighty wants. He's close to us and he says, balls in your court. What do you want? Wish it. Desire it. Take the first steps towards getting it. And I'll make sure that come Rosh Hashanah time, come the day of creation, that will, that desire, that Ratzon, is going to be actualized. I thank you all for listening. I wish everyone a Shana Tova Mutaka. As they say, a happy and sweet new year. Siva Vachasim Tova. We should be inscribed and we should be stamped into the book of life, to the book of real eternal life. And thank you for listening. My email address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com.